Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, actually, I'd like to thank UNESCO and also the government of France for the fantastic partnership to prepare the background document uh, for this session. I hope we can see the slides soon, um, which looks at how we can generate the financing required to deliver on the Paris Declaration, uh, but also how we can use resources more effectively and most importantly, better align resources with needs. I don't need to tell you how bad off track we are with living up to what we've set out in the Paris Declaration. Three quarters of low-income countries and half of middle-income countries basically are not anywhere near the finan financing targets that you set out in the Declaration. And the pandemic, obviously, as we have heard here, is not making this any easier. But also, I should say that actually it was low and lower middle income countries that have seen the greatest progress. We should also acknowledge this. In the short term, you know, you might have hoped for stimulus money, but less than 470 of the $16,000 billion to fight the pandemic actually ended up in education. And actually, 97% of that in high income countries. And the more you get sort of on towards the red on the map, the actually the smaller the share of stimulus money that went into education. It seems whenever there's a crisis, you know, the urgent takes precedence over the important. Stimulus money made a good impact on technology, you know, making this a lifeline for education, as we just heard. Uh, but you can also see just 40% of the money went to support the most marginalized, no? which we are talking about in the, in the Paris Declaration. So you can see how this crisis has not just amplified the gap between countries, but also clearly the gap within countries. No? And this despite all what we heard today. So that's basically where we are. But uh, Borain, you asked me to talk about the future. In the short term, getting stimulus money right is absolutely important, but in the medium term, there is no way around mobilizing more domestic resources. The key is to start with a plan for you know, effective investments in education. No? And the logic of this is actually quite simple. No? The key is to start with a plan for effective investment. No? You cannot improve what you cannot see. That's why data is so important. No? And then better policies lead to better teaching and learning. And you can find plenty of examples in this room, actually, that prove that point. And that leads to better outcomes. And the good thing is that better educated people pay more taxes. They're more productive. At least they should be. Just to give you a figure of, on this, in OECD countries, every college graduate generates $100,000 more over their working life than what taxpayers spend on that. No. Actually, getting education right is a good business for government. It actually creates a lot of resources, a lot of money. No. And more taxes then mean more revenue for government, and then you can reinvest it in better education. And that's precisely the virtuous cycle no, that has enabled you know, countries like South Korea or China to reinvent their economies through better education. No. But to convert higher productivity into higher revenue, you also need to have a functioning tax system. No? If you look at this figure here, no? many lower income countries have tax to GDP ratios of less than 15%. No? That's half of what you see in OECD countries. And even there, we complain about you know, not raising enough taxes. No? Changing that requires you know, strengthening the formal economy making sure people and companies actually pay their taxes, They're reducing the size of the informal economy, no? bringing more agents within the reach of tax systems. No? And that also means designing the kind of social protection systems in a way that incentivize that kind of formalization. And it's also about ensuring that taxation doesn't hinder formal job creation and doesn't disincentivize workers' entry into the labor market. No? But it's also important to abolish poorly targeted tax spending. No? Many countries actually have a very narrow tax base as a result of a very wide range of special tax provisions. No? 
And we in education are actually a good example. You know, you find so many countries that provide tax re reductions for private education expenditures, which is precisely the kind of means that then actually the richest benefit the most. No? Sometimes you more also may wonder whether corporate tax incentives, you know, are always that are designed to attract foreign direct investment. I know that, but to what extent they're really delivering on this now? And in many lower income countries also, personal income tax remains underdeveloped, sometimes not well designed. The income from dividends, capital, interest payments is often taxed at very low tax rates. I know I'm very critical here, but if we do not get those issues right, we will never make it towards SDG 4. And not least, you know, international tax cooperation is very important, so ensure that everyone pays their fair share of taxes. And a crucial point that's often forgotten is actually how important it is to engage multiple government authorities and ministries. The more you make education a whole of society enterprise rather than just an education enterprise, the more likely you're going to see more money in education, at least what we see across countries. And the private sector can also create opportunities to expand the fiscal space for education and create the conditions for more self-sustained funding. Actually, digitalization is an obvious example. We have seen that in the pandemic. So that's about generating the required resources. But let's also get to the least popular issue among us educators, and that's about spending money more effectively. No. Results from our PISA comparison show that the relationship between spending and the quality of education gets very tenuous once you get above a certain level. Now, for countries that spend very little, you can see here on the left side, money makes a huge difference. But then, you know, you get to a point where it becomes more questionable. You can see here, for example, Estonia and Malaysia invest roughly the same amount per student. But Estonia ends up to be one of the highest performing education systems. We also know that spending money more equitable, aligning resources with needs, often leads to spending money more efficiently. If you come from a wealthy background, you're going to always find open doors in your life, even without a great education. If you come from a poor background, you just have one single chance in life, and that is meeting a great teacher and being a good school. And you can see often it doesn't work out like this. Now, the reality looks like this. The way we invest money actually often reinforces social inequality. You can see here how in all you know, income groups, most of the money gets to the richest children, not the poorest. Now, you can see basically <coughs> the, the red bubble being smaller than the yellow one. Now, and actually, the more you get towards lower income group countries, the more extreme that disparity really becomes. That's basically what we have to address. And actually, the answer is not very difficult. You need effective funding formulas, basically creating sometimes quite rigid structures that force money to be directed where it can make most of a difference. Now, that takes you into account student needs, geography, school conditions. All of those are factors that should determine where the money should arrive and where countries have funding formulas in place. They're much more likely to spend money equitably and efficiently. And if you combine, you know, good funding formulas with outcome and output focused approaches to budgeting, you're going to get much more equitable and efficient spending. So value for money really matters. There's just one last point I want to add, and that is the importance to develop much better data on education finance. You know, as education ministers, you're often the poor cousins on the cabinet table. No? Your colleagues from the health ministry, from the trade ministry, from the economics ministry, they come to the finance minister with a very detailed plan. They know exactly how they're going to spend the money, what the rate of return on this is, what's going to come out of this. And education, they're not very good at this. We need to become much, much better to create a much stronger value proposition for why this is, as President Macron this morning said, the most fundamental investment that countries can make in the future of their economies, their societies, and in the planet. Now, it's very simple. Our schools today are going to be our society and economy tomorrow. Thank you.